Uh, grateful to have Facebook participate in our panel today. Part of what we're going to talk about is creative marketplaces, the awesome work that's being done in machine learning, and one of my personal favorites, this concept that I like to refer to as a UA bot. And we'll describe what's going on today in UA. Tom, our CMO, is going to jump in. He's going to talk about uh, some very tactical tips and tricks. So if you guys are actively involved in doing Facebook UA, he'll give you some really good pointers. And Facebook's going to talk about this concept from their creative team that allows you to repurpose assets for your games in some really powerful ways. All right, so a little bit about us. As I mentioned, we are a Facebook and Instagram marketing partner. We were founded in 2013, so we're almost uh, five years old. Uh, we're based in San Francisco, and what makes us unique is that we offer an end-to-end -end solution for doing user acquisition. And what that means is we have a creative marketplace for doing tremendous videos, image, and ad copy creation at scale with designers and video editors around the world. We have a self-service tool that will enable you to do bidding on Facebook, and of course, we'll do it for you with managed services. And then lastly, our whole focus is on direct response advertising and lead gen. So ARPU, CAC, ROAS, cost per subscriber, et cetera. No branding, it's just hardcore DR. So that's a little bit about us. And on the rim are the clients that we are currently working with or have, work, have worked with in the past. So one of the premises I want to posit here is that creative has become the key differentiator for doing UA. And for those of us who have been in the industry for a while, what I think you've seen is both Facebook and Google and their optimization capabilities have really dramatically improved. And what that means is the level of effort required to optimize a campaign is substantially less today than it was as recently as nine months ago. So part of this is machine learning, right? So they're smarter about the person that you want to attach uh, the ad to. Uh, and this concept of event bidding. So if you look at the kind of timeline down below, and you begin way back in 2015, right? Way back, um, only three years, where Facebook was allowing you to do click optimization. So those people who had a higher propensity to click on an ad, back then it was really helpful. That quickly evolved into August with conversion optimization. So I didn't want happy clickers, which were primarily young people. I wanted people with a higher propensity to convert. So that simple change radically transformed how you spent money on Facebook. And then as you keep going, it went into smarter conversions like seven-day optimization, which is traditionally how games are doing ROAS, so return on ad spend bidding. And then this great innovation was app install bidding. So that happened in December of 2016. So I wanted people who wanted to install a mobile app. Uh, we were all a little concerned would it work, but it, it worked phenomenally well. So Facebook, through its algorithm, had a, a high understanding of the people who not only wanted to see the ad, would click on it, but then would follow through, open the app, so that it would count as an install. So then if you fast forward to very recently, Let's put away the, the app install because I'm, I'm less interested in someone who installs the app and I'm more interested, are you going to spend money? And so let's call it ROAS bidding and eventually that became value-based bidding. And the difference is you may want anyone who's going to click and, and pay for the app, but wouldn't you rather have someone that's going to pay a lot? So a whale, maybe a little bit, a dolphin or a tiny bit, a minnow. And can you segment the way that you're buying media so that you can properly bid for the people that are going to pay you the most and bid less for the people that are going to pay you less? So this innovation has consistently driven better performance across doing uh, installs. And so as bidding has been automated, like the really hard work of the UA manager is slowly being simplified, creative becomes the differentiator. And what's interesting is that if you look at the bottom kind of timeline here, Facebook's done this really interesting vignette. It's not only creative, but it's creative to the right person at the right time of day on the right device, depending on where they physically are. Are you on a subway and you're on the go? Are you leaning back and you're ready for a longer experience? So each one of these 
types of user experiences can now be matched with a different type of creative. And thankfully for us in the industry, at least today, creative cannot be algorithmically generated yet, right? Can't be done with machine learning. I know companies are working on it, but not today. So this is one of my favorite slides, and people are often surprised by the, the bullet in red. So I want to be specific on what I'm trying to say here. We spent roughly $100 million in buying media for Facebook last year for our clients. And what we have found is that about 95% of the time, if you are a direct response advertiser, your ads are your videos, your images are going to fail. And what that means is they're not going to outperform the best performing asset in your portfolio. So the, the net impact of that is you've got to have an awful lot of volume of creative going into the top end of testing in order to sustain the ROAS and scale that you've achieved because the ads are going to burn out over time. And so this concept of rapidly uh, fatiguing ads is really il illustrated well in the bottom graph. So the orange line shows what happens when you have a, a great piece of creative. It comes out, it performs extremely well, you get excited, you increase your spend on it, and then as the ad is shown to more people and there's more impressions given, it slowly fatigues, and over time it fatigues quite a bit until you get a new creative winner and then the performance pops back up. And so there's this constant kind of sine, sine wave battle of new ads, performance drops, new ads, performance drops. So you can imagine the volume of assets you need if you're spending in the, the six or, or seven figures per month. So when it comes time to do creative, I think we can all empathize with these kinds of frustrating emotions, which is we all need more creative. For those folks that are doing videos, it's awfully painful if you invest a week or a month in doing the video and it bombs just as fast as a single still image. Uh, it often goes stale too quickly, and of course that depends on how much you're spending. And I say equally as difficult, if you get a winner, man, there's an awful lot of formats to put it into. If you go beyond Facebook and universal app campaigns on Google, and you look at Unity and AppLove and Vongo, and you try and create all of these formats for winning videos, it's a heck of a lot of work. So a creative marketplace is a way to help with that. So what is it? In its most simple form, Think of it like a sophisticated Google Doc. The uh, UA manager will come in, they'll write a brief, and the brief could be very simple as, here's my top five videos, do something different. Um, here's my constraints around creative and brand guidelines. And then video editors and designers from around the world will execute and deliver these briefs. Now, if you pick the right marketplace, you'll find that these people are actually experts in that particular media. It's not like 99designs where you've got to shift through a bunch of stuff. It's actually really talented folks doing the work. Of course, advertisers are always in control. If you want to make revisions to it, you can simply make the revisions as many times as you want. When it's final, you can automatically upload it to Facebook or to Google, depending on what your preference is. And then with the right platform, you get really enriched reporting so you can see how it performs, not only rolled up across multiple audiences, but get some form of ROAS management and how the ad fatigues over time. So what are the benefits of using an external team? I think the primary benefit for us has been this concept of alleviating tunnel vision from the internal team. And, and what I mean by that is, if you work on a property for several months, and you're constantly pounding out videos and images, it's natural that your creative kind of juice is gonna falter some because you've been doing the same thing for a lot of time. When you bring in external teams, the ability to kind of refresh that creative energy is really high because they haven't hit the same barriers and failures over and over again. So they're gonna think very differently about the problem. So you get this huge influx of new concepts, some of which you can immediately reject because you've tried them in the past and you know they're not gonna work, and others are completely fresh thinking out of the box. Now the benefit to the internal team, when you get a winner, now remember, it's 5% of the time you're gonna get one, then your internal team takes that winner and they create versions of it. So not only do you help your internal team by giving them fresh creative thinking, the propensity of them to then have a success because they're creating variations of the winner is much higher, which is also exciting, right? Because they're not failing as frequently. So what is the business model of a creative marketplace? By and large, it's pay for performance. You have to be able to cover the base unit costs because videos are expensive 
to produce. So there's always some small per unit price, but a majority of the marketplaces that exist charge some form of percent of spend. The reason the percent of spend model matters is because it ties you with the marketplace. If the ad sucks, remember 95% of the time it's going to, you immediately shut down that video or image and your costs are at or near zero other than the, you know, the per production cost. If it succeeds, then there's some participation in the upside to a limit. So it reduces the advertiser's risk. And this, this uh, chart over to the, whatever side that is, right, I find really interesting. This is one of our large advertisers, and the, the challenges of finding the winner are just perfectly illustrated here. So that's over three million in spend, and the graph is how much money any individual asset spent. So you can see there's an awful lot of zero, right, or near zero, as we produce several hundred pieces of creative that bombed, and off to the far right are those things that actually got traction and took off. It's a really great math way of illustrating this concept that most of the time in creative you're gonna bomb, so move fast, fail fast, and learn quickly. <clears throat> so to that concept, I'm sorry, to that end, there's this kind of basic design idea of concepts versus variations, why you need one or the other, and to keep it simple, Concepts are brand new ideas, something that hasn't been tried before, so they're fresh, completely out of the box thinking. Tom and I you know, have gotten into, I don't know, several thousand arguments about this. Uh, I'm a big variation guy, he's a big original concept guy, and he's usually right on this one. It's really hard to do new concepts, because um, while there is technically an unlimited number of things that you can do creatively, all of us are constrained by the assets that we have access to, you know, most of these things are in Unity or some form of an engine, so you can't necessarily tear out the pieces and put them into a 3D rendering environment and, and then have a kind of a junior editor take over and recreate assets. So we're, con we're restricted to the assets that we have. Um, variations, we've got that winner, right, that one in 5%. Now we know that it's gonna work. Then like a bucket of Legos, you tear apart the individual pieces and you create something new, which has a much higher propensity of being successful. So in talking to our clients over the past five years, we put together a set of questions, which and I'm just gonna quickly go through, that I think help guide um, the types of conversations we run into and lead into this next concept of brand versus performance. And so you know, this idea of do you have a creative Bible? How strict are you with the creative Bible? Um, What's your voice? What's the tone? What's your audience? You'd be surprised how few companies have thought through these questions. And what it enables us to do when it comes time to write those creative briefs is really understand the guideposts. How far can we go? How conservative do we have to be? How broad thinking can we go? And really what it boils down to is this next slide, which is, uh, happens with most large companies. Are you a brand? or are you doing direct response? And it depends who you ask in the company. Uh, oftentimes the CMO will say, nope, we're a brand, here's my Bible, you can only use this font and these colors, and you gotta do it this way. And then you go to the UA team and they're like, eh, throw that all away, just give me performance. So <laughs> we get stuck in the middle of these arguments and what we try to do is come up with a kind of disarming conversation. And the conversation usually goes something like this. Most of these videos and images are gonna die in less than 10,000 impressions. So your relative exposure on anything that you hate is pretty small. If it's one of those five percenters and it really does well, let's come back and fix it, right? Let's make it brand compliant. Let's figure out the pieces that will make you like it more. But in doing so, we've done something in that conversation, which is one, we found a winner, yay, that's awesome. Two, we can now show them the impact of making it brand compliant. So if the brand compliance drops performance 30%, the CMO or CFO can now get in an argument. I know we're blue, but green works, so we're going with green, and then they can you know, do a smackdown. And what we often see is that direct response when done the right way bubbles up and influences the brand, and often will influence the App Store and Google Play Store designs because math is math and performance is performance. So the takeaway from this slide is move really fast, try and get people to loosen up so that you have a lot of creative freedom, and when you, when you have creative freedom, you'll find winners. So 
there's an awful lot that you can do to extend the shelf life uh, of an existing ad. These are several of the things. If you're interested, we have a free white paper on our site. You can download it. There's hundreds of examples of ads that work well. Um, I would say probably the most important thing we can explain, at least in terms of best practices, both on YouTube, on UAC from Google and Facebook, if you're doing videos, make them eight seconds or less, probably six seconds or better. Your call to action needs to be in the first two seconds and it needs to be strong and compelling. In addition to that, you have to tell a story. What is the app? Why do people care? What actions do they need to take? And that all needs to happen within six seconds. So it's a really different way of thinking about a trailer or a video. This is something that happens in a hyper-compressed time frame. The good thing for you as the creator is, in eight or six seconds, right, you're, you're really constrained with time, so you're gonna have to move fast, and that enables quicker editing to happen. And then literally, as I mentioned, this concept of a bucket of Legos, tear apart the entire design uh, piece by piece into these other formats. And I think, if it'll work, we have a video here um, that I'm gonna talk to you as it plays. So what you'll see is text on the top, text in the middle, text in the bottom. Stunned how often that actually matters. Do you split the screen in half vertically? Do you split it horizontally? While some of the best practices you'll read don't put text in images, 99% of the time text in images are substantially better or not because you're telling somebody what it is and what to do. Um, and almost always, just one of the things in closing to hand off is user-generated photos versus stock photos. If you think about what Facebook is, it's us with cell phones taking pictures of friends and family. The photos are not beautiful. They're not magazine and TV style quality. They're grainy and, and you know, kind of compressed. If you take a perfect image and you put it on Facebook, it sticks out. So almost always use user generated uh, video and footage or beat it up, right? Make it grainy so that it fits organically in with the, with the uh, experience. So next coming up is Rich Jones. He is the client solution manager for Facebook uh, on gaming, and he's going to walk you through some cool stuff. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. Hi, everybody. My name is Rich Jones. I'm a client solutions manager at Facebook. I've been with Facebook for about two years now and working with the top tier gaming advertisers on Facebook. Prior to joining here, I was working over at AppLovin on the advertising side of the business and working with apps ranging from e-commerce to travel to gaming, kind of the whole nine yards. Today I'm up here to talk to you guys about creative and how creative plays in the Facebook auction. As Brian mentioned, we have a lot of products now that are bringing more value and optimizing more efficiently, so creative is really more important than ever. Uh, joining me today or throughout the conference is my colleague Jay, and him and I are both working on a new exciting part of the business, and we're shifting focus in 2018 to working more closely with kind of up and coming gaming advertisers and making sure that we have the products and resources available to support you guys as you are on your trajectory for growth. So please feel free to reach out to either of us throughout the week. We'd love to have a conversation. All right, let's go ahead and get started talking about creative and the Facebook auction. So I'm sure everybody in this room has been on Facebook for a while now. So everybody can remember back in the day, Facebook ads used to look like this. All right, you're scrolling through your newsfeed, and you're basically seeing these static images in a second. You see static images and you have copy, right? So everybody was just kind of the name of the game was making the best image you can, modifying your copy, and trying to drive your results. Well, that was years ago, right? So the new experience is looking something more like this. You have ads that are spinning and, and popping and rotating. You now have square images and square video. It's far more interesting and more captivating than the static image counterparts that we had previously had. So the question is, how do we adapt, right? How do we shift from being this image, static image company or advertiser to being somebody who is now video focused? Facebook as a company has said that we want to be video focused company. And so making sure that you're able to adapt and, and kind of grow in that direction is gonna be key. And of course, this all ties back to the Facebook auction. So I wanted to throw this slide up here to quickly review the Facebook auction with everybody and make sure to kind of demystify it, and make sure everybody understands how to think about creative in, in the auction. So as you guys are aware, the Facebook auction is just an eCPM auction. And it basically breaks down into three main components. So your total value can be viewed as your advertiser bid, estimated action rates, and your user value. The advertiser bid is pretty straightforward. That's your CPC, your CPI, whatever it is, it's your bidding mechanism, right? 
the estimated action rate component is, an act is a component that is actually really closely tied with your creative. The estimated action rate could be seen as easily as like your predicted CTR, right? So how, how strongly is your creative speaking to the audience that you're serving, and are you generating the conversions you're looking for? Last component here is the user value. User value I like to call the organic bid, the organic component, and as you guys know, we are a social network. So you need to make sure that the content that your users are seeing is interesting to them. In this way, we can't just be showing every single impression as an ad because we would lose all our users and we would effectively have no product and, and no value, right? So we need to make sure that users on our platform are actually enjoying their experience. Now, how does this tie back to creative? Well, in the, in the auction, you're competing with the social content as well as competing with other advertisers. So it's really important to make sure that your creative is being used efficiently to maximize your delivery. Some advertisers have really poor performing creative, so they must bid really high to get delivery. As you guys know, that's not really a sustainable model, so it doesn't work too well. Opposite of that, let's say you have really good performing creative, that means you can now bid at a lower level and still get the same amount of delivery. Obviously, it's very important to maximize your creative here, and specifically when we think about estimated action rates and user value, I like to think about it as how well does your creative speak to the audience you're serving, and will the impression shown lead to your desired result? So in terms of predicted click-through rate and estimated action rates, this is really going to maximize that middle component there. In terms of the organic component, how interesting do we think the individual is going to find this ad? And is this a high quality ad? I'm sure you guys are all familiar with uh, positive and negative engagement on Facebook. And so if people are liking, thumbs up, and smiling, whatever, you get more delivery. And if people are Xing out of your ad and they don't like the content, Facebook is going to ping your delivery a bit because it's not something that users are enjoying. So it's important to keep this in mind as you're building creative. And one other thing I want to emphasize, as Brian was, was mentioning as well, Facebook now has products like app event optimization and value optimization. And these, over the past year, have completely changed the game for buying on Facebook. You now have optimization models that are helping you find purchasers and helping you find whales. So really, we're kind of doing the heavy lifting on that side of the business, but we can't do the creative side, right? And that's where creative comes in. It's going to be more important now in moving into the year than ever. With that, uh, I wanted to touch on this idea that Brian actually spoke about earlier, and our creative shop at Facebook wanted to do a little exercise over the course of two weeks to see if we could very quickly work with a select group of advertisers and help them produce videos from the assets that they already had available. It was called our Click to Convert um, segment, and these are the four learnings that we, we kind of pulled out of this. So our creative shop basically looked at hundreds of top performing ads, and they broke them down into four different variations. What we notice time and time again is these four concepts. Basic motion, brand in motion, benefit in motion, and demo in motion. With the help of uh, consumer acquisition, we went ahead and put together some examples of each of these, and we can go ahead and dig into those now. So here we, we, we worked with Glue, or consumer acquisition worked with Glue to pull together these examples. And this first one is the basics in motion. So here, all you want to do is just use your existing assets and just add some light animation. Again, at Facebook, we like to think about stopping thumbs, right? If you're scrolling through your newsfeed, what are you showing to the, to the viewer to make them stop their thumb and look at your ad? So here's the first example. Oh, there's supposed to be sound with this as well. But you guys can see there's just a general light animation here. So now instead of it just being a still, it's something that pops out a little bit and gets the user engaged. Similarly with Design Home, a little bit of animation, right? And this is real, relatively easy to do. Again, I want to emphasize the whole point of this exercise was to do a quick two-week stint to see if we can produce uh, creative very quickly so we can continue feeding it into the Facebook auction. Next, we have Brand in Motion. Idea here is similar to the previous one, with the exception that you want to also incorporate your brand. So you really want to get it out there and make sure people know what they're looking at and to keep your brand growing. Tying this back to the equation, this uh, having a strong brand is also going to help with your conversions, right? Everybody sees a brand that they know, they're more likely to engage with it. This example we have here shows we have Design Home, bam. It's exactly the same as the previous one, right? But now you have the actual title there. So now you're building that brand. And here, Restaurant Dash. Again, it's a similar variation on the previous one that we did, which was just basic motion, but now you have your brand associated with it. Next, we have Benefit in Motion. This one I find particularly interesting. So benefit in motion is you're basically telling, literally telling the user through copy or the viewer through copy what to expect from your app. 
This is gonna help avoid the situation where you have an ad, a video ad, somebody downloads, installs, and they look at your app and it's not at all what they were expecting, they immediately uninstall. So by actually telling the viewer what they could expect from the app, it really helps with down funnel performance metrics as well. Right? So now you kind of have an idea of what you could expect when you download this. It's not just something that's going to be completely misleading. In the example with Design Home, so you can see you have this design element, you get to vote, there's like a little bit of a social element, you can see some people in there. So it really gives you a lot more of an idea of what you could expect once you install the app. And as you guys are all familiar, when the industry shifted from static to video, everybody's on video now, right? I think for most of my gaming advertisers, we're seeing very little percentage going through static, and that's because video performance has been able to generate such greater leads. So again, it's also important to emphasize what the actual value is for the user once they install. And lastly, we have demo in motion. So with demo in motion, I think this is actually particularly interesting. Over the past two years, I've seen a ton of gaming advertisers adopting this idea of putting their actual gameplay into the game. And our creative shop believes that this is working particularly well for two reasons. One it shows the gameplay on the actual device. So again, the user knows what they can expect. And two, it's demonstrating to the viewer that this is actually a mobile game. Sometimes you just see a video and you're not entirely sure what type of game it is. It could be PS4, it could be Xbox, whatever. This is showing you that you could just with a few clicks get to the App Store, download this game, and play yourself. And I think the, uh, you know, I just want to keep emphasizing that this is all stuff that the, the team worked very closely with uh, a handful of advertisers, consumer acquisition with Blue in this case, to quickly put these together and it's all just wrapped together from whatever assets were already available from using your static ads. And we'll get into a demo on the next following slides here, just to give you a brief overview of kind of how the whole process worked together. So let's take a look at those now. So this is the basics in motion demo. This is basically just showing you what you saw there and now the assets that were used to produce this. And the final video. Again, simple, right? Our team was able to put this together very quickly, the consumer acquisition team and the glue example here. And this is stuff that you can iterate on very quickly. As, as Brian mentioned, it is important to make sure that you're producing creative quickly because as his graph showed, you know, 99% of the creative might not take off. And I think that's something that, that everybody's trying to stay ahead of and trying to make sure that they're understanding the importance of as you're thinking about building creative for Facebook. We got the benefit in motion example here. Yeah, I think time and time again, we, we see advertisers that dump a ton of investment into producing these images that look really great or these videos that look really great. And ultimately what we see happening is it takes a long time to produce. So instead of actually trying to move quickly, you know, move fast and fail quickly as Brian had said, a lot of advertisers think that they need to have the highest quality stuff. And so months later, you end up producing these videos or this handful of videos, you put them into our algorithm, and you serve them. You're not seeing the, the performance you expect, expected. So while the art team has produced some really great art, didn't necessarily focus on the idea of, did this art speak to the audience? Did it speak to who we were targeting? You know, it's important to think about the demographics of your app and to think about the users that you're trying to reach and the message that you're trying to get across to them. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next one here. I apologize, there's no sound on that one, guys, but a few points here that I think are, uh, not that I think, that our creative shop put together and things you should keep top of mind as you're designing creative for Facebook. Number one, first three seconds matters. Again, stopping thumbs. As you guys are scrolling through your newsfeed, what's popping out at you? Is it a static image or is it something that has a bunch of colors, an explosion, something like that? Really start strong and try to captivate the user quickly. Second, don't rely on sound. So time and time again, you might want to have a video that has sound. And if that's an important element, 
make sure that you emphasize it. I'm sure you guys have seen the videos before. Somebody's pointing down, or there's some text that says, turn sound on, something like that. Do something to communicate to the user to get the sound on. Next, text can support the message. Right? As we talked about before with the benefit in motion example, you can use some simple text to, em to emphasize what the benefit is and to get your point across. Make it only as long as it needs to be. Um, Brian touched on this as well. Shorter is better. I mean, ultimately, you guys are trying to get people's attention and keep their attention for a very short period of time. If you can say your entire message in a shorter time, highly recommend it. If you have great characters, use them. I think this one's particularly interesting, and there's advertisers out there who've done a fantastic job of doing this, but putting characters first, you know, you kind of start building that relationship with the viewer and the character, gets them a little bit excited about pursuing down the path, the journey, whatever it is, right? And lastly, think about people's motivations. The art team really wanted me to emphasize this one because, again, it seems like time and time again we have designers and artists who are building really high quality art, but it maybe not might be the best thing fitted for the audience. So make sure you're thinking about how this art is going to interact with the audience that you're serving and to make sure that you are taking into consideration the emotions you're trying to reach. With that, thank you guys so much for your time, and I'm gonna pass it back to Consumer Acquisition. All right, I'm Tom Young, CMO at Consumer Acquisition, and I run Facebook Strategy. Uh, so we've talked a lot, kind of high level, about creative testing and the process we should go through to develop assets. Uh, equally important is what's the process that you should run uh, in order to make sure that you're extracting value from testing and that you're not introducing too much waste in that process. Uh, so the first slide here is really just kind of highlighting something we tell almost all of our advertisers, which is you need more ads, more creative testing, more variables on the table if you're going to find the types of wins that are going to transform your business and put you in a position to scale at the metrics you're looking for. Um, so really the point here is whatever you're doing today, test more. You can always test more. Uh, talking a little bit about testing best practices, creative needs to be born from somewhere. It should be born from a hypothesis about uh, what do you think is gonna resonate with your users and why? So start with that conversation, go into development, and start putting some assets together. Uh, in terms of test structure, always make sure that you're testing a single variable to avoid cloudy data in your results. Uh, there's some areas where you may want to do multivariate testing and run multiple variables at the same time, but for the most part, a clean, simple A-B test that has one creative variable is going to yield quick results that are actionable and also take a little bit of risk off the table. Uh, third, before testing, you really need to understand your KPIs and define what it would be to be successful. Uh, if you run a whole bunch of ads and you get a bunch of metrics back that say, you know, click-through rate over here is great, but my revenue in ROAS is better over here, which one of those is actually better for your business? It's really important to understand that. Uh, oftentimes, there's multiple KPIs that you might need to look at, but really just formulating the hypothesis up front, understanding what your KPIs are, that's going to position you to run a successful test. It doesn't matter how great your creative is. If you don't go through this process up front, you may not extract value from the testing process. Uh, during the test, there may be some challenges in terms of getting the type of data that you're looking for, uh, actionable data that's got consistency, repeatability, and predictability behind it. Uh, sometimes Facebook will uh, serve some creative objects more impressions than others, for instance. So in that scenario, it's really important to think about the overall test and maintaining integrity of your data as you make changes. So in that scenario, where let's say you're testing four videos, one of them isn't getting enough impressions, what we would recommend there is to change all of your ads the same way, whether it's increasing bids or budgets or taking some action to get more aggressive and force those impressions. The challenge is if you just increase bids or budgets or the aggressiveness of the one ad that's under delivering, uh, you've now introduced another variable into your test that could impact the results. So uh, we spend a lot of time trying to sort through test results and identify uh, how much of this noise is something that's a true result versus just volatility that's in the marketplace. And it, it's tough. So there's a lot of ways to kind of sort through that. 
Um, the other thing I'd note during the test is sometimes you're just gonna have creative that very early reveals itself as underperforming in a massive way versus the other tests uh, or the other variables in your test. So let's say, for instance, you've got, I don't know, six videos. Four of them look to be about the same, but two of them just have terrible click-through rates. Uh, they're not monetizing. They look really bad on early data. Probably worth shutting those down, failing fast, and just moving on to a new test. Uh, I think humans kind of have this tendency to say, I love that video, I love that image, I want to force it to win, and you think that somehow if you just let it keep spending, that's going to happen. Uh, very often that's not the case. And so again, just going back to pure math, 95% of the time you're going to fail. In that scenario, fail fast, move forward, come up with a new test, and don't force it. Um, and then in terms of post-testing, uh, we've talked about getting to the right results. Now you've got the results. How do you do the analysis that's going to allow you to determine uh, which of these creative objects are actually beneficial for your business? And um, the lift in the results uh, in there could be a number of things. Oftentimes it's ROAS, but sometimes on early data you just don't have enough payers coming into your game to say, hey, this is the best monetizing ad. Uh, in that scenario, you may look at your cost per install, you may look at your cost per, per tutorial completion, uh, cost per registration. There's all sorts of early metrics that occur after the install, but prior to monetization. And understanding what those metrics are is, is helpful in this scenario. Uh, multiple KPIs is another thing that we always recommend. And the KPI doesn't even need to be a Facebook metric. Uh, sometimes the KPI could be consistency or predictability, for instance. So let's say you run the same test uh, with three different audiences, and you end up with three different results. You may not feel comfortable that there's enough predictability in that scenario to go out and declare a winner. Uh, in a reverse scenario where you've run the same A-B test with three different audiences, and the same winner has presented itself three times, you're now staring in the face of, uh, consistency, and you can then say, okay, this is probably predictably going to be a winner. Um, so it's not just your cost per install, your cost per paying user, but it's consistency and repeatability in the results that you need to be comfortable with. Uh, and then also, when you've got a winner, or you shut down a test because you didn't have a winner in either scenario, uh, it's always good to basically just figure out what your control variable is at that point. It's either a new winner or your existing control if you didn't beat it, and go into another round of testing. Uh, again, no matter what amount of testing you're doing, do more. We've talked about this a little bit earlier, but uh, getting a little bit more actionable in terms of what are the type of variables that you might want to test in your Facebook ads, and this focuses primarily on videos. So video duration is a really big one. Uh, five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. These are massively different amounts of time. And at 30 seconds, the likelihood of capturing a user's attention for that entire time drops quite a bit from five seconds. So you see uh, much lower uh, view through rates on those types of videos. But in some cases, if you've got a longer story to tell, and you really need to be able to support your story with additional content, the longer video can be very beneficial in that scenario. So I've seen videos that are three seconds crush it. I've seen 30 second videos crush it. And a lot of times that uh, is dependent on the type of advertiser. Moving to branding, uh, we talked about brand in motion. There's a lot of interesting ways to introduce your brand, uh, often through logo usage. And uh, when you're playing around with logos, there's a lot of different ways you can introduce it. Um, you can introduce it in the first few seconds of your video. You can test that against putting at the end. So basically, if I lead with my brand, am I going to capture people that know about me and are really interested in this game because they know about me? Or should I start with the content to get them interested and then say, by the way, here's who we are. Go download our game. Uh, this one I've seen go both ways. I've seen very strong brands perform better with the brand at the end, sometimes at the beginning. Point there is you've just got to test. In terms of position, let's say you've got a logo. Uh, you can put that up top. You can put that in the bottom. You can play around with the size. Uh, the visual prominence versus the other objects on the screen. Um, and all of that is really interesting to test. So uh, again, the prominence of the logo, uh, more prominent north on the video, less prominent south. It, it depends on the game itself or the app that you're advertising. But we see very different results there. Also interesting is removing brand altogether. So I think 
uh, when you talk to the branding folks in your company or you know, most advertising people, they want the brand there and it makes sense because you're putting dollars out there, you want recognition. But in pure DR advertising, oftentimes the brand, or the brand logo is clouding the message. So if you can focus the user's eyeballs on something that's more important in terms of getting that conversion, uh, oftentimes that's more effective from an advertising perspective. And then uh, moving to creative refresh, this one is interesting because that 5% of time that you do get a winner, uh, that winner is gonna have a different shelf life, either depending on time or money or sometimes both. Uh, spend is the big one. The faster you spend, the quicker your creative objects are gonna burn out and the more quickly you'll need to replace them. Uh, time also matters. There is uh, seasonal promotions, there's seasonality, there's all sorts of things that may allow an ad to perform well in January, but that same ad in March or April may just bomb. So there's uh, always a need to refresh creative. And no matter how many winners you've got, if you spend enough money, at some point they'll burn out, you're gonna need more creative. In terms of using winners uh, from, from testing for new launches, uh, this is what we always recommend. So if you are uh, scaling up and you've gotten a decision to make, should I launch an old ad that has spent a bunch of money and performed well, or should I launch a recent winner from testing, uh, get your new ads out into the wild, see how they perform at scale. Uh, gameplay is another interesting one, especially um, for a lot of the newer apps that just have beautiful graphics. And uh, you can tell a story differently about your app if you use pure gameplay and say, quite literally, here's how this thing works, uh, versus using more of a trailer type experience where you can say, uh, here's characters and really interesting things in the game to focus on. Uh, a couple other things in here that are worth testing, presence and absence of characters, uh, especially when they're recognizable characters, they tend to perform well, um, including text versus not including text, and then also uh, the thing I would say here that matters a lot is fast action sequences. So especially if you're doing gameplay and you've got a minute of just kind of boring things in the game that happen before something really exciting, uh, you're better off focusing your time on the more exciting type of content. And you can piece those exciting uh, uh, pieces of content together and create a fast action sequence. So dynamic creative testing is a fairly new product from Facebook that does a lot to help facilitate the creative testing process. Uh, what it does is it allows you to multivariate test multiple objects so you can plug in up to 30 different creative objects and uh, Facebook kind of mixes and matches to figure out what are the right combinations of creative objects to perform well. Um, so when you do that, you're giving a lot more control to Facebook and uh, everything I've seen the last couple of years, the more control you give to Facebook, the better you're gonna perform. Uh, they're taking a lot of the hard work off the table from UA managers, making our life easier and we go focus on creative uh, and that, that seems to work very well. So on this um, uh, specific process here, the creative should be the only variable that you are testing. Uh, if you're introducing too much around audiences or other things, you're just gonna get cloudy results, so better to avoid that. Um, and then with any test, you want to identify your winner, treat that as a control, and move on to your next test. Uh, this slide here is specific to gaming advertisers that manage their business to ROAS or return on ad spend. Um, the, the main thing that we're focusing on here is every app, every game is different. Some people are monetizing aggressively on day one. Some people wait until you've completed a seven day trial. So the game matters a bunch, but in every scenario, uh, your return on ad spend at day one is very different from your return on ad spend at day seven. And you have to understand how your revenue and your gameplay metrics mature in order to optimize for them. Um, so using rules to power this, uh, in addition to the um, creative testing that you're doing with Facebook is really helpful to, um, to help optimize for ROAS. So we look for a lot of early signals of performance to say ads are good, let's keep spending money. Um, you know, my day zero, my day one ROAS looks great. Uh, but you have to know what those metrics are versus day seven, for instance, where you would expect a lot more revenue. Uh, failing fast uh, as a concept is something we've talked about uh, in this presentation. And it's a tricky one because on Facebook, a lot of times 
uh, early performance for ads is not indicative of what's going to happen at scale. So you do have to take some risk and spend money on underperforming ads to see if they'll pop up. Um, but when you've got enough metrics on the table to say that you know, these ads are very likely to underperform as we scale spend, uh, you need to start making some decisions to fail fast and pause ads that are losing uh, the test, and that helps to take some financial risk off the table. Um, talking a little bit about rules, so uh, when you're gonna run a creative test where the math says about 95% of the time whatever ad you put out there is going to perform worse than your best ads, creative tests tend to drag down the portfolio of your, uh, or the performance of your portfolio. So putting rules in place that limit risk and basically allow ads to get paused or fail when you've got enough data to make that decision uh, helps quite a bit. And so just you know, bids, budgets, pausing, uh, these are all things that can really impact the performance of an ad. So putting rules in place to make decisions you know, while we're sleeping and throughout the day uh, really helps limit risk after you've launched a whole bunch of ads and uh, Facebook is running the process to, to get to the results. Uh, on that note, overactive rules can definitely harm performance. So something that we talk about at team all the time is, what's the right amount of times to adjust my budget in a day? Uh, every time you adjust a budget or pause an ad or change a bid, an ad goes back into a learning mode where it's being recalibrated. So if you're changing an ad every two or three hours, you end up in the state of indefinite recalibration where your ads never have a chance to get out of this learning phase and into an optimized mode. So there's a balance here where you want rules in place to limit your risk and help guide the business. But if rules are kicking in too frequently, you're never gonna perform well. So this is something that uh, just requires optimization and sensitivity to. Um, this here is something we've talked about uh, today, which is the industry has shifted. So we've shifted from optimizing for installs, which is uh, you know, the front end of the, com or the conversion, towards app event optimization. And so on mobile app installs, which is where we were years back, um, the advertiser is identifying quality by saying, here's the audiences that I wanna go for, give me installs, I don't care who it comes from as long as it's in that audience. Um, and in that scenario, lots of campaigns are required to scale, and a lot of segmentation is required to really hone in on the, the user quality that's gonna drive the best performance for your Facebook ads. Uh, flash forward, app event optimization, uh, I can say, you know, same with Rich, pretty much all of our advertisers have moved from mobile app installs to uh, app event optimization. It's been a process that's made, I think, the UA advertisers' lives a lot easier, but the, the great thing here is that Facebook knows where the buyers are, and they're not serving your ads to people who are unlikely to convert. So because of that, you can really open your, up your audiences, give control to Facebook, and say, you know, here's the planet, go find people that are gonna convert in my app, and they are incredibly effective at doing that. Um, so the last point there is really just the, the focus on signal quality of strength to predict LTV, uh, and secondarily on the audience, is, is really just that Facebook is gonna understand where the buyers are when you're optimizing for them. Uh, so in this case, we've talked about app event optimization being more efficient than mobile app install optimization, but for a brand new game or app, and you, when you don't have any events flowing in that Facebook can see, you've gotta build up enough users that are converting and taking those actions in the game uh, for Facebook to get those signals. So oftentimes, what you do is launch a new app or a new game, or, or an app or game that's been around for a while and just hasn't spent that much on Facebook, uh, launch it on mobile app install to allow the system to start learning, collecting data, uh, and getting to a point where it can be efficient with app event optimization. As you collect that data, you start launching your app event optimization ads, naturally scaling the portfolio in that direction. And at that point, generally what happens is you see your cost per install rise a little bit, but your uh, ROAS, your return on ad spend, generally rises much faster than that cost per install as Facebook really starts to zoom in to finding the best buyers or most valuable users for your game or app. In terms of, uh, maximizing UA with app events. So the point of this slide is basically that when you run app event optimization, you can get away with a broad audience, meaning you don't even need lookalikes or interest targeting a lot of the times. Just tell Facebook, 
here's the geographies I want to go after and let them find the buyers versus if you're optimizing for install, you really want to make sure that you're layering on the audience quality uh, so that Facebook can zoom into those users on their own. Um, so lookalikes, for instance, would be a, a great way to do that. This slide is highlighting that same thing, which is the, uh, at the bottom row there, when you see you've got broad optimization for targeting, value optimization uh, on the right side, basically what, what this means is you tell Facebook optimize for value, which is a revenue component, and give them the broad audience. They can go out and find them. Or at the top of the pyramids, uh, you would need lookalikes as a layer to help uh, filter for quality for Facebook as they go after app installs, for instance. Uh, this is just a sample of how a lot of uh, games would do segmentation at the country or geo level uh, when launching. So the point here is that um, you often want to test a, a whole bunch of ways of grouping the different countries together. So you can do worldwide. You can do just a single country like the US. You can do uh, groups of countries, which we would call tiers. The uh, point there is that depending on your app or game, it may monetize very differently in different markets. And uh, also for Facebook, they may have an easier time if you give them worldwide, for instance, or maybe they have an easier time if you give them just the US because that's where the payers are. So this is uh, the way of kind of identifying best practices for your app or game. Um, this slide here goes a little bit deeper into that, which is what is the process that you want to go through in terms of launching your first uh, creative testing to getting to a point where you would scale. And the, the point here is really that you would want to launch uh, creative tests in kind of a small market to determine which creative is going to perform well. Uh, once you've identified that creative at that point, it makes sense to start scaling your spend, testing it with new audiences, and trying to determine if performance will hold up at scale. As you've collected enough signals uh, and conversions for Facebook to begin optimizing, um, then telling Facebook to start optimizing for value and app events is where you start to pick up quality. Um, after that process, you can layer on additional targeting um, and, and continue that process of scaling. But again, consistent with everything we've said here is never stop testing. Um, I'm blown away. We've worked with advertisers that have spent many millions of dollars, and you inherit an account like that. It's like, well, how am I going to beat this creative? Because they've tested you know, 5,000 tests over the past years. Always happens. So it doesn't matter how much you've spent. Uh, you will always find value in further testing. So key takeaways from what I've talked about today, uh, app event optimization, and then value-based bidding, which is app event plus revenue. Um, they've improved performance for Facebook advertisers. And we've seen just a massive shift. So two years ago today, 100% of our clients were optimizing for installs. Today, I'd say at least 90% of our spend is probably on app events. So it's been, uh, again, huge for UA managers, makes our life simple, really puts the focus back on creative as Facebook figures out the quality piece. Uh, AEO enables the use of broader audiences, which is another form of simplified management. So we used to you know, hyper-obsess about, is it men, is it women, is it young, is it old, what, who's my audience? Uh, today, it really doesn't matter. You cast a wide net, Facebook's going to go out and find these buyers. You'll see them shift impressions towards the demographics of users that are most likely to convert. You'll see them spending very little money in the other segments. So uh, it, it works very well. We've talked about testing aggressively, just knowing you're going to need winners all the time. You're going to need to produce hundreds, thousands of creative variations over the course of your, your app's lifetime, um, and putting some automated rules in place to limit financial risk in that testing process is, is very important. Uh, in terms of those rules, you've got to understand your KPIs. And uh, using those KPIs, you can optimize for your revenue and your ROAS as, as it ages so that you make sure you're making smart decisions for a uh, spend that's only a day old versus spend that's seven days old. Uh, the last thing I would say here is that uh, kind of as a bonus that we didn't talk about, creative testing is almost always the path out of a rut or poor performance. Uh, you know, we've got all these tactics on the table. Which event do you optimize for? Which audiences? Which demographics? These things move the needle. They help with performance. But every time we've been in a situation where uh, performance was kind of stagnating, 
when we hit a big home run with creative testing, that's when we see the numbers pick up. So you know, this concept of Facebook getting smarter and making our lives easier, it puts all the focus back on creative because that's how we differentiate in the market. And that's all I've got, so I'll pass it back to Brian. All right, thank you, Tom. So I only have a few minutes before Q&A, so I'm gonna kind of rip through these. The next two slides are my favorite slides. If you are a Facebook buyer or a publisher, I highly recommend taking a screenshot. So we've done 52 bake-offs, so head-to-head, -head, SmackDown, Gladiator style, you know, win or lose the business. Um, sometimes they're awfully scary when you're talking, you know, a large spender. What we have found is uh, bake-offs are actually very quite healthy. Um, they validate performance, they increase the intensity both of the internal and external teams, and they help everybody gather fresh thinking. So our best practices, and by the way, of those 52 bake-offs, we've won them all, just for the record, so we're kind of like Mayweather, or two better, I guess. Um, this is the best practice for doing a bake-off. So whether it's one, two, or three companies, we recommend a length of 30 days, a budget somewhere between fifty dollars to $100,000, right, if you're spending in the, in the mid-seven figures. Um, and you have to put conditions on everything. So each company has to spend 90% of the budget or they fail. And fail means you're out, right, you lose. You have to spend two-thirds of the budget on iOS, one-third on Android, depending if you have both apps and you know, which one is monetizing better, or you lose. Um, can't do any mobile engagement ads, right? So you have to strip the way that we as agencies cheat. You take all of that off the table and you normalize it. Um, and then you have to determine early on, is it Facebook or a mobile measurement par partner like Adjust or Apps Flyer or Kachava that's determining the, the arbiter of, of the success? And then almost always you should use a seven day click, zero day view. While that's not normal practice when you're running the app, uh, the elimination of view through ads will help even further refine who's responsible for getting those ads. Now, here's the, here's the caveat to this. All companies who are participating start with the same seed audiences and the same seed creative. So you dump all your Facebook, um, sorry, all your Photoshop files or your After Effects files into a folder. Here's the audiences. And then you stop sharing. So as the eight advertiser, nobody can see each other's data. No one can see each other's creative. No one can see the way that they're doing bidding. So it's, it's fair. Here's the real kicker. You share metrics every Tuesday and every Friday. So this is heat, baby. This is like, are you failing or are you winning? If you're failing, you're gonna step it up, and if you're winning by a little bit, you're gonna step it up, and it's painful. As the advertiser, it's cool, right? Because you're gonna get all of this incredible focus on the business. And there's just a snapshot of how we'd recommend sharing the data. So it's company one, company two, kind of core KPIs. Here's the benefit of this. The SmackDown's over, the gladiator battle is done, someone's dead, someone's alive. The winner gets the accounts. So they get to see the best practices of the other companies that they outperformed, which helps them then step on the shoulders of those learnings. The best thing is if you have an internal team that's doing UA, they also get to learn from all of the companies that participate. So it's, it's a really healthy process. So if you think of it, you know, is this too many cooks in the kitchen? And the idea, no, actually it's not. You know, these best creative practices on the creative side really help flow information exchange between the teams. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, the new variations help them. But also the UA uh, side, it helps an awful lot to understand emerging best practices because they change all the time. It's hard to keep on top of them. And you're gonna see different companies take different approaches. Sometimes they work extremely well. And it's always great to get external thinking in. This also helps um, if you're currently working with an agency or a marketing partner and you wanna transition to self-service, right? Look at those best practices as your teams are about to do that transition. So with just a couple minutes, I'm gonna posit a theory here, which is uh, machine learning has fundamentally transformed the UA manager's job. We're not here yet, but we're getting there. And the concept is, um, as Facebook and Google learn how to do optimization much better, it's taking away the doldrums of the grunt work from the UA manager, and that's leveling it up into doing creative. And as you can see on the timeline here, it's moving from impressions all the way through value-based bidding. So just on spend, it gets much more efficient. But what if we went further? Look at what Facebook's currently doing today. Here's what can be automated. You can automate bidding. You can automate the placement. So Facebook, Instagram, Facebook audience network. The audience targeting can be automated. The budget, so the, 
budget per ad set can be dynamically changed based on marketplace conditions. You can do dynamic creative optimization and even dynamic language. So think about all of the pieces that if you give them control, they can help you automate. So it's a really fascinating thing thinking about as we go down the pipeline of more sophisticated buying, what happens to the human, right? It's almost like globalization. As you go out overseas, it becomes less expensive as you go, but it's difficult to, to get those folks trained. Once these tools come in place, which it's happening very quickly, as you've heard today, um, you'll be able to do UA anywhere. Uh, and I'm gonna skip through this just so we can get to the QA. That's it, thank you. <laughs>